Well, look who's here. Are you ready for a shocking experience? In today's lesson, you'll learn how an ignition system's high energy spark is made and the ways to help your customer make the right decision when they have an ignition problem. So don't just sit there. Let's get it on. The story starts back in 1907 when one of my heroes, Mr. Charles Franklin Kettering, invented the first point ignition system, which rapidly replaced the old buzz coil. His system worked so well, how well did it work, you ask, that it took 65 years for a better one to come along. The High Energy Ignition System, or HEI. But in 1985, Pontiac went one better by introducing the Direct or Waste Spark System. Now today, we call it Distributorless or DIS ignition. It rapidly replaced the older ignition systems. Now here's why. The point system is strictly mechanical, with parts like the points, rubbing block, and distributor cam coming in constant contact, which would continually wear out all these mechanical parts. And that's why you had to have a tune-up ever 12,000 miles. Now, on a DIS system, no two moving parts come into contact with one another. You got that? That means nothing wears out mechanically. Isn't that something? So, the specs stay constant and accurate, and emissions, well, they're reduced. The distributor cam that used to open and close the points to charge and discharge the coil windings well, it was replaced by the crankshaft position sensor. Now that tells the module when to charge and discharge the coil. Well, how does it communicate with the module? It communicates by using a Hall Effect integrated circuit. Now, isn't that something? Or magnetic induction. By using magnetic induction, a magnetic field is created and it's moved across the copper wire winding. And that, my friend, creates electricity. And this is the number one way most things happen on today's high-tech vehicles. Now let's take a closer look to see what we can learn. Here's a typical crank sensor GM's been using for many years. It's positioned only 50 thousandths of an inch away from the trigger wheel. Now notice that the trigger wheel has seven. Y'all count them here seven notches. Six of those notches are spaced 60 degrees apart, but the seventh is only 10 degrees apart. Now isn't that something? Now that means it sends a different signal to the control module, and that signal tells the control module the number one cylinder is at top dead center, and the firing sequence begins. Now on a DIS system, each coil fires two cylinders simultaneously. That means at the same time. Understanding just how that happens can be very helpful when your customer is trying to diagnose a misfire situation. So here's the scoop. Now to properly balance the engine, the pistons are always matched in pairs, which are sometimes called companions or sisters. Now that reminds me of two sisters I met in France. Maybe another time on that story. <laughs> Companion or sister pistons are always in the same position. When they are at top dead center, one cylinder is on the compression stroke and the other's on the exhaust stroke. On the next revolution, the roles are reversed. But the companion or sister pistons will always be in the same position inside their cylinder. Now when they get to top dead center, both spark plugs are fired and here's where this gets very interesting. The coil's secondary winding discharges a high voltage current through the tower, which travels down one spark plug wire and fires the forward spark plug from the center electrode to the ground electrode. It mess up. But for electricity to flow, it has to return to its source. 
And in this case, the source is the coil's secondary winding, and the path to return to it is through the other tower. Now after firing the forward spark plug, the current travels through the block and fires the second plug from the ground electrode to the center electrode. The current then travels what could be considered backwards up through that spark plug wire and returns to the coil secondary winding through the tower. And the path, well, my friends, it is complete. So, what do you look for if you've got an ignition system problem? First, remember that every time a spark plug is fired, small bits of metal are transferred from one electrode to the other, and they flow in the same direction as the electrical current. Let me see if I can clarify that for you. That's why the center electrode on a spark plug was always worn when you check the wear on one of the earlier ignition systems. Uh-huh. However, on a DIS system, half the plugs will show wear in the opposite direction, which is why the grounding electrode will be worn, while the center electrode will always look new. Oh, let this be a lesson to you and your customers. Always inspect both plugs from the same coil to be sure you understand what's going on. Does anybody out there know what happens when an ignition wire develops high resistance? If you said the path that electrical current flows is interrupted, you are correct. So when that happens on a DIS system, how many cylinders will lose spark and must fire? I can't hear you. If you said two, oh, you get an A+. Hold on. Believe it or not, you're only correct in some cases. Now let me show you why. Electricity is just like me. It's pretty stubborn. Hoorah! When it meets up with high resistance, it will take the next easiest path to complete its mission. Sometimes it jumps from the wire to the block. Fires one plug, then returns to the coil secondary tower to complete the path. Other times, it's easier to jump to the coil's primary winding through the control module, where it flows through the engine block and then fires one plug and returns to the secondary winding to complete the path. Now, when this happens, you have a serious situation, my friends, because that control module circuitry is now experiencing tremendous pressure, not to mention the coil is now destroyed. How long can a control module withstand this kind of unnatural pressure? My friends, I don't know. How many times can you hit a windshield with a baseball bat before it shatters? <laughs> I don't know that either, but I do know that every time you swing that bat, you're doing damage. And before too long, you've got glass all over the place. What's the solution to this problem? Design a coil that will protect the coil and control module if and when enormous pressure and high resistance occurs. This, my friends, will keep your customers satisfied. And that's just what the fine folks at Wells developed just for you. On the outside, it looks just like the original coil and even includes the exceptionally conductive aluminum secondary towers. But when we cut it open, we can see the real beauty of this baby. Notice our steel laminations fit precisely around the secondary winding. This creates the most intense and effective magnetic field generation. Our secondary segregated bobbin is precisely, I mean precisely, wound to produce a high voltage output that can provide more than twice the normally required voltage. And that's a good thing. Our primary winding is made of high-grade copper to ensure superior non-constrictive conductivity. What that means? Smooth, continual flow, my friends. But how do we handle the number one coil and module killer, resistance? Well, y'all listen up. By adding this high dielectric sleeve between the primary and secondary windings. Now you're probably wondering what old techie means by that, so let me tell you. 
this high dielectric sleeve makes it virtually impossible for the current to pass from one winding to the other, which means both the coil and the control module are secure from premature failure caused by high resistance, stress, and pressure. In fact, our lab has tested these coils under high stress conditions, and the Wells coils lasted more than 850 hours. Lesson learned. When you recommend a Wells coil, you can be certain your customers will have a stress-free life, at least when it comes to automotive repair. That is it for today, recruits, but keep your ears to the track. A briefing on modules is coming soon. Dismissed!